All right, Rena, you're on. Good, good. Well, first of all, I love doing this. I usually uh, I'm about ready for bed now, but not really, not quite. However, um, I have um, begun to be fascinated by the Guastavino experience and the broadness of the, of it. And um, the way that all began, is, I wanted to give you a little background about me, uh, just personally, and then I'll tell you how I first encountered that work. Um, I grew up in Rome, Georgia, which is Northwest Georgia. And um, my father and his family ran a lumber company. So they were a part of building and my mother uh, was an art major. She was a painter and in their retirement years, they traveled overseas and just loved <clears throat> different areas and different worlds. So I think I got all of some, a little bit of my interest from that and from them. And um, <clears throat> I went to Hollins College in uh, Virginia and it just so happens um, that um, there are um, in, in 1842, which is when Holland was started, has a little tie-in with uh, the Guastavino. It, at any rate, um, thank you so much for coming. And if you have questions, um, maybe just put them in the chat or send them to Marie and I'll try to save some time uh, at the end for some of those questions. If not, I can send them later. I, I will be taking notes if there's a question that okay. Rena can't answer. Oh, good. Yes, because there will be. So, <laughs> so I would like to just um, begin by saying that I, one night my husband was out of town and I flipped through the channels and I came upon a lecture at uh, the University of North Carolina in Asheville by John Oxendorf. And by now, perhaps you are aware of him. He's a professor at MIT, and he was doing a lecture about uh, Guastavino uh, for the students there. So I was absolutely fascinated. And that was probably in 2012. And um, he was very compelling. And even though it was just black and white, more or less public television, uh, he was addressing those students that were interested in architecture and constructing buildings of art. Um, I wonder if you all are have heard of him, John Oxendorf. If not, I've got, um, I will, I'm sure you'll hear more about him. There are two things I want you to listen for. I would like for you to look for and listen for five significant people. Make your little jot down your list. And I would like for you to also be ready to think about five different significant books about the Guastavinos. And that's certainly no you know, limit to everything. So um, after that, that was about in 2012, we, um, he had spoken there and it was of interest to his students and to others at UNC Asheville. And so there was an event at a uh, conference center. We have a lot of conference centers because there's the beautiful mountains draw people. And it's always been from hundred, a hundred years. It's been a great place to come. So that's not why Guastavino necessarily came, but he ended up coming to Black Mountain and uh, because he was uh, asked to do a building, uh, some work at the Biltmore House in Asheville. Have, have any of you been to the Biltmore House in Asheville? I don't know if I have a way to see that, but um, at any rate, good. <laughs> um, and there are other Biltmore houses. And I was um, uh, in um, uh, in uh, a little bit North Maryland area and um, went to, or I think it was in uh, Delaware. 
And we went to a great museum and I looked across the street and there was another, uh, there was a Biltmore house. There was another Vanderbilt home. And so we uh, went to see that and it also had Guastavino vaulting. So I think they used some of the same architects. <clears throat> so we're back to Black Mountain now and we're keeping your eye out for significant people and significant books. So we went to, um, we had a big conference there and John Oxendorf came and um, at that point, Christ Mount um, was just one of those conference centers, Disciples of Christ, but knowing their history and the significance of it um, energized them to create different signs and uh, areas of that space uh, where the Guastavinos lived and where he made town. And it just so happens that I can walk out of the back of my neighborhood and walk about 15 minutes and I'm right there on the Guastavino estate. <laughs> so that's kind of fun too. And those signs are always good and interesting. The He um, lived in a house there. It was a wooden house. It was a lovely home. And it was... Um, torn down when a developer purchased the property, but there's several homes that's still very wooded and he did some farming there. He did, um, made his tiles there and that he had a, a great kiln that uh, was also basically a Guastavino vault. And um, he had a wine cellar because he grew grapes and made wine. Sounds like a good Spaniard to me. So here I am, not only just fascinated, but uh, also um, finding myself as Guastavino's next door neighbor, more or less. And of course, then I have already, I'd already been to the Biltmore house, but I went there with new eyes, including if you go into that space, there is a gatehouse. And if you look up at the gatehouse, the tile is just outside, it's a vault, it's Guastavino. And then the entrance to the um, building, to the house, has Guastavino tile, the exit onto the side, the porches and some spaces inside have Guastavino vault. <clears throat> so um, at this point, um, John Oxendorf has created an incredible Guastavino exhibit. And there are ways that you could have this at your library. Um, he's very gracious. You can print your own smaller panels. I know of another, I can tell you a place who did that and what it was like. Uh, but I did go to the exhibit that was in Boston at the Boston Public Library and in um, Washington, DC at the building uh, museum in Washington. Our children live in Washington, so we're there a lot. So that was really fun. And we were introduced to some of the finer parts and details of cohesive destruction, which is a signature of the Guastavino company. And uh, I realized how huge his work was and became and was involved in the building of America in the age of the Gilded Age. So um, somewhere along the way, and I wish I could remember when um, this happened, but John Oxendorf um, uh, had told us so much, but then I realized, and probably that's from him as well, and Marie can share this link with you. So there's some key, as I mentioned, they're key people. And so we come along, it's the 60s. And by the end of the 50s, nobody is building big public buildings and spaces like that. What are they doing? They're building boxes, squares, and that sort of thing, more of the modern spaces. Even though some of his became a little bit toward that, there were um, lots of opportunities at that point, but not for the Guastavino vaulting. So the company basically um, closed 
And um, that that particular um, company spot where they made tiles was in Woburn, Massachusetts. So you all are close. Has anybody been to the um, the tile factory in Woburn? right outside of Boston, about 30 or 40 minutes. And well, I recommend it highly. It is still, this this space is still making tiles, but not Guastavino tiles. So, but let's go back to the factory and it's the end of the Guastavino era, essentially. And that comes along, here we're in the 60s and there's a professor at Columbia University in New York. George Collins is his name. And he got pretty excited about Guastavino as well. And so he is looking into this and trying to figure it all out. And so he calls the factory and says, where is the paperwork? Where's the list? Where's the documentation of all these vaults that the Guastavinos have done? here and everywhere else. Lots of other places, I should say. So they said, well, gosh, we are so sorry, but we have just put those in the dumpster. So he said, do not turn in that dumpster. I will be there. And he drove all the way up there and got everything out of the dumpster and now if you have seen that there's a list, a very long list of about 1500 spaces. This is one of my copies that I haven't written on so much. And there are just tons there. I think it's 50 pages with 30 on each page or 30 pages with 50 on each page. And this is what George Collins preserved. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, one or two pieces of paper, one of, or two documents, you know, might have been missing somewhere or sometime. So that is kind of part of a wonderful mystery that turned out well. And he documented all of those. And then that caused eventually people to wonder about that and to continue to um, look up and try to figure out if they had Guastavino vaulting. Now, the next person really, though, to bring the Guastavino vaulting out is John Oxendorf. Um, and I, I hope that some of you have seen his book, um, The Art of Structural Tile, you really must get one at the library or online, but it has become such a great um, book that uh, I don't think he's had a second publishing. He needs to because the ones online are kind of um, actually pretty expensive, but uh, you can usually get them from a library. So maybe your library could, could buy one. Uh, but before that, there are a couple of other books that I want you to know about. And one of them is written by Rafael Guastavino, the original. And I'll, I'll show you that too. You can't really see, I can send you pictures, but it's called An Essay on the History and Theory of Cohesive Instruction, Applied Especially to the Timbrel Vault. And I have made my way through this. I don't know that I completely understand it all. I need to read it again. And then the Guastavino father and son um, uh, ha are the, the Guastavino two is the father. Guastavino three is the son. And so Rafael Guastavino four has written this book about an architect and his son. And that's easy for you to get. It's well worth it. It, it tells the story. It tells information. It's um, it's just it's just great. You can see I've got little tabs all over the place for that. So those are a couple of books, and I can also put those on either a chat or send them to you at some point. Okay, I'm going to put those on the floor because they're kind of big. 
Um, so now I wanted to, that's kind of a little bit of an overview and you, you've seen my list of all these many buildings and I hope that you are duly impressed. So the Collins list has been put, there's a link to the Collins list and Marie has that link and she can send that to you. Um, and it's so fascinating. That's what this big thing of papers is. So I'm looking through that list and I thought, well, let's just see what's in Georgia where I grew up. So there were a few in Atlanta and by George, there were some in Rome, Georgia, where I grew up. And they are at Berry College. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that. It's, it's one of those um, work and study colleges. And um, I immediately, I had, I had taught high school there or middle school really for a while and not at the college, but at the middle school. And uh, so I was familiar with the campus and it was, you know, right there in my hometown. I've been there many times. So my husband and I went out there. First of all, I remembered that Mrs. Berry, who uh, basically built and subsidized the college, had um, just really um, gotten some money. She was a great earner of money. And so she got a big amount of money from um, some donors who were just you know, happy to give it to her. Henry Ford was one of the people, and that's the main one who gave that money. Um, Henry Ford, so therefore, those are called the Ford buildings. And they are very obviously Gothic and um, looked like Guasavino Vault. So we went out there, and that was not on the confirmed list because we have the list. Some of the buildings are have been torn down. We don't have exactly which are. So if in the back of John Oxendorf's book, he has the ones that he knew that were documented. And so he had a, a fun little thing that he would take you to lunch if you found one that hadn't yet been documented. So we got all excited about that. We went out there and it was very clearly very clearly his um, work at those Ford buildings. They were um, Gothic and style. And so I'm gonna, I don't know if this is gonna be a, gonna work for you all at all. I don't think it's going to, but I can send you some pictures, but um, you can see that roof line and you can see this roof line. Maybe if I turn out my... It's a little reflective, yeah. yeah. let me turn out my lights here. Okay, now see if you can kind of see that. That's a little better. Can you see that vault? Good. Oh, yes, we can, sorry. Okay, okay, good. And then this is the the girls' dorm at Barry with the that same Gothic design. So that shows that it looks like it, but I had to document it. And so we went to the um, the building that housed all the documents for the buildings at Barry College. And by George, I want to turn my light on here. Here it is, little blueprint. Specification division for Guastavino arch work. I was beside myself. And that's why I think I'm so hooked on this in my own hometown. I did want to mention to you all that this um, has uh, consumed a lot of my time and interest. And I hope it will continue to do that, that for you all. Um, so next thing is, meanwhile... The, the son, they, they immigrated here in the 1880s 
and uh, the father lived to eighteen uh, to 1908. But I'm, I don't know if Marie has this one or not, but perhaps you can see this. If I, this is the cover of their, oh, that's the light over there. I'm so sorry. Anyway, those are of- Well, that's not a bad angle. That's a good angle, right? Okay. Um, and those are the domes and that's the cover of their brochure. And if you'll, again, in the um, questions, I can send you these pictures. I can do something a little bit better than that. Then um, this is a, a, I don't know if you can see that. So he, this was um, the construction was basically standing in the air. And this is how they put their vaults together. I've got to get to that part because that's really big. So um, here in Asheville, here's the, the, the wine cellar of the Guastavinos. And that's the only vault remaining at Christ Mount where he um, lived. And that was actually called Rhododendron Farm when he was there. Um, and the, the um, kiln collapsed and that has not been rebuilt, but there are other significant places in Asheville that I think you will enjoy when you come. I would say that the highest point of the career of senior really and junior who finished it is the Basilica of the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. And this is the roof of that. And it is an iconic building um, in Asheville with many domes. And the main dome and vault in that building is the largest freestanding dome in North America. And of course, the, the very tops are copper there, and that's why they're so beautiful. Um, anyway, and, and it's and Mr. Guastavino Sr. is buried in there. And um, so that you can open the door to the crypt and see the coffin, which is kind of decorative also. Um, so the, the next kind of area that I would like to focus on is a couple of other uh, areas while we're thinking about this. So I want to I want to ask you all about um, certain places and things and that you may have seen. And um, I wonder if um, has anybody been to Plymouth Rock? You, you can. Yes, I have. Um, I you can now unmute yourself if you want, or you can just respond in the chat. Yes, that'd be great. Well, you know, Plymouth Rock is not that impressive when you think about it. See, there it is, 1620. Sorry. And, but guess what? There is a magnificent Guastavino vault over it. That's much prettier. Oops, I'm so sorry. How's that? And this is what that looks like. It's worth the trip. It's just beautiful. So that's a special place and a significant place in our country's history. And um, then there are many others in Washington, D.C. But since my children live there, I have been to a lot of those, <laughs> maybe all of them. Um, how many of you have been to uh, the National Cathedral in Washington? I bet some of you have. Well, that is Guastavino vaulting um, to a large degree at its peak. And um, I'm going to have to send you all these pictures. I'm not doing a very good job on that. Um, so you can kind of see that Gothic vaulting. Then the original Carnegie Library in Washington is um, now, it's now an Apple store, but it has Guastavino vaulting. I'm gonna leave those alone. So in DC, most of the public buildings, so the, the um, National Building Museum, the uh, 
Library of Congress, the Supreme Court, the House, the Senate. Uh, you know, there's a war memorial on the mall that's just a small dome. That's Guastavino. At Arlington Cemetery, there's a portico, sort of like the one that um, you saw at um, Plymouth Rock, and that is very similar. It's also Guastavino vaulting. It's just, and then just everywhere, so, some of us in the basement, and the um, at the Supreme Court, we couldn't find that. Of course, we really couldn't get in. But it's the drive-through portico that you drive in to go into the Supreme Court, which most of us cannot do. So that found was fascinating for me as well. But let me get back to um, some of the really significant things about this work. First of all, um, the Guastav Mr. Guastavino and his son, which were two and three, immigrated from Catalonia in uh, 1881, a part of that integration and, and immigration that we talked about. And he brought this technique, which was a Catalan Spanish technique, but he was inspired by a beautiful grotto where layers and layers dripped down over the years and created this beautiful vault, just nature. And um, he had done a lot of um, errands for uh, architects and he graduated eventually from the architectural school of the University of Basel Barcelona. Again, the Grotto Cola de Caballo. And it was, all kind of connected with nature. It was natural, it worked. So the layers of the dripping are like the layers of his vaulting. The key thing that was what allowed him to come here and be successful was the creation of Portland cement. It was quick drying and very useful. And he just went gangbusters. Um, he used a certain kind of Bessemer furnish to fire his tiles. And in the 1870s, there were new building codes because so many fires had happened. And so he came there in the Industrial Revolution. There were few Spanish speakers. He came through Ellis Island. By the way, all that Ellis Island tile is Guastavino. If you've been to Ellis Island, if not... It's probably the largest, I think, that I've ever been in or seen. And in 1882, um, he uh, was asked to submit a design. And um, let me, I got to turn on my light, excuse me. Uh, and he won uh, some money and he bought lots and um, sent his son to school. And then in the panic of 1884, he lived in his office and um, he married a woman named Francesca. His um, first wife did not come. And in that time, that was the beginning. Francesca lived on the Guastavino uh, estate at Rhododendron that's right, right behind me. <laughs> so um, the son, uh, learned everything that the father did and he created even more the cohesive destruction and um, he got a patent the son knew to get a patent in 1887 and by 1888 his work was widely known now there's some other uh, key things his first major work I think that was in America is the Boston Public Library so it, a library is very significant in his work. I'd love to know um, how many of you have been to that library. I bet all of you have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I have too. Um, so, and that's where John Oxendorf begins to focus a lot of his work. Meanwhile, in 1888, uh, when he got that, gig, you might say, he hired 
some an accountant. And it turns out eventually there was an accountant and his son. So the Blodgetts, the father and the son, maintained his financial status that he could not do. So by 1888, he had become um, widely known due to the library. And then in the 1880s, the Vanderbilts got excited about it. And George Vanderbilt, who built the Biltmore House here, I think is the first one who um, had uh, really built and wanted to, uh, was the first one that built the vaulting at his home. So you've got the Collins Discovery, you've got Oxendorf, the Blodgetts, and um, then, you know, I I feel like I have a little tiny part in, in documenting the place at Barry. Um, my husband and I went to Chicago uh, several years ago, and both of the um, the chapels on both campuses Aren't they in there one across the river from the other? I believe that's right. Those are Guastavino vaults. And strangely enough, we booked a Hampton Inn, which was next to a theater, and it had a Guastavino vault in it. It was just crazy. So look that up and when you get that link. Um, uh, can I can I interrupt you? I know you're pretty busy. No, I but... want you to interrupt me. Okay, so so Vicky uh, Vicky, um uh, she said her library, Ray Memorial Library, Franklin Public Library, has roof ceilings floors that were constructed by the Gustavino Fire Insurance Company in 1904. Okay. And she doesn't think they're on the official list, and could they apply to become a member of the Alliance? Yes, and you don't have to be a, a, a fit. Well, let me check the list, and I'll get the list. Uh, maybe you can send that to me. I, I will... Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I'll the 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 I will send the um, the message to you. Okay, and it it might not be on the list because I I um I've thought many times when John when uh, George Collins went to get everything in the dumpster and archive it, something could have blown away or maybe something wasn't in there. So uh, yes, that would be that would be really fun if that would happen. That would be great. Um. Any other Vicky, thoughts? Could, Vicky, could you just send me privately your email so I can forward it to Rena? Good. I hope that you all will um, find enough interest and fun in continuing the study. It never ends. It's just kind of crazy. Everywhere I go, every town or city, I'm, I've got my link on my computer, on my iPad. And I can check and make sure. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to really see so many in Washington, D.C., our public buildings, many, many of his um, items that he did were public buildings. And that was important to him and really something that he wanted to do. And let's face it, the Biltmore houses are now more or less public buildings, but everybody wouldn't have been able to afford a Guastavino vault in a regular home they were building. Um, so remembering that the Industrial Revolution had come um, and he had won that design um, uh, award. So um, he, um, the panic in 1804 caused him to live in his office. And, um, but he eventually came to Francesca, uh, I mean, excuse me, came with Francesca to Black Mountain and was uh, widely known by then. Now, I there are lots more things I could probably go on and on about, um, but I thought I could stop here for a little bit and um, see what some of your questions are, see if we might be able to talk about some of those things, or at least let me take some, get some notes that I can uh, continue with. So I, I read the one question that's in there from Vicki, okay. um, and I will forward the whole question to you on email. Okay. Um, so you can, okay. and then you can get back to her. All right. Anybody else have any 
any particular um, interests or has did any of you get to one of the exhibits that traveled? I don't think I knew about it before when it was in Boston. Um, uh -huh. And it's way too big to put in my library, although that would be really awesome. <laughs> well, I will say this, they, the reduced panels we have um, in our Swannanoa Valley Museum. What you just need to do is to come to Black Mountain and I'll give you the tour of Black Mountain uh, with Guastavino also. <laughs> All right. I mean it. I like doing that, of course. All right. Well, um, as you think. I actually want to, I forgot to say this earlier, but I do want to say now that the following libraries are sort of co-hosting this event. Northampton, Mass. Mm -hmm. um, I understand they have Gustavino Vaults. Okay. Their library. Natick, um, the Bacon Public Library, Rockport Public Library, Linfield Public Library, Hanover Public Library, and Lancaster Public Library. Oh, great. Uh, Lancaster Memorial Library, Sayer Memorial Library in Lancaster, and Dennis Public Library. I do not know if any others have Gustavino vaults, but they were all participating. Um, see great. If they're on here. That's great. I'm so glad. That's wonderful. Um, all right. I think I gave you a little bit of a challenge to listen out for five people, five significant people. Anybody uh, want to take a, a jab at that that we talked about? And then five different books. Who are some of the people? that were significant in the success of the company. You've got two with the Guastavinos and who else kept the company going? The, the Blodgett father and son, the accountants, they were very significant people and um, George Collins was huge to have done that. And um, I think John Oxendorf with his magnificent book is also to be given so much credit because we had no way of knowing this out in the public. Any other thoughts or questions about those folks? And I'm gonna ask you one more question. I wish you were here so we could just sit around and chat afterward. Don't forget about the link. You'll want to have that. Now, can you give me an idea, or do you know, maybe I haven't mentioned them all, I don't think I have, of the significant books? Well, I, I'm just going to tell you those because I, I don't think I gave you the option to yeah. So, I mentioned these. I mentioned this one right here, which is the um, the essay on cohe cohesive destruction destruction construction. You can't see that very well. And the other one is an architect and his son, the immigrant journey of Guastavino two and three, and it has the cover of on it. And then John Oxendorf's book that I think you're familiar with. However, two other books have been um, written and they are children's books. They're absolutely beautiful. One of the things I had to do when we discovered Barry uh, was to document it and in order to have it, um, you know, guaranteed that that's what it was. So that we were able to do. And there is a, an interactive link online with Guastavino vaults. I think you can just Google it, Guastavino vaulting interactive link. And the person who manages that is in Spain and her name is Berta Miguel. 
So I had to submit all of my information to Berta Miguel in order for her to confirm it. And she and two others who've been very significantly involved in this research has written an absolutely stunning children's book. And to tell you the truth, if I had just sat here and read this book, it would have probably been a lot better than all of my uh, information. It, it gives you, um, it's, it's not a little children's book. It's just very, uh, I, I really recommend that you buy this book. It comes in paperback and hardback. I think the paperback's $10 and um, the hardback is 20. Meanwhile, since you know we all uh, around here in Black Mountain have a little bit of that guastavitis, and it is, as I said, very contagious. So I, I, I apparently was waxing on to one of our neighbors and very good friends uh, that we spend a lot of time with, and the, the husband got fascinated with this. He's very artistic and creative. And his daughter, who works with the State Department, lives overseas, uh, they together put a children's book, probably a little bit younger children, and it's called Searching for Guastavino. And it's not as much a technical book. It does have a lot of information, but it was, it's very, it's a, lovely story and a fun book and just the illustrations are beautiful so I recommend that one also and you you are welcome to have my email and I will try to answer any questions or find out the answer since I am no John Oxendorf that's for sure anything else that I can say or do or ask or find out. Um, I, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, you can unmute yourself. Uh, this is sort of open Q&A time. Um, I can stop the recording. I will stop the recording so it, you don't have to feel, um, <laughs> you know, intimidated. And um, feel free to ask Rena questions. I will try to send put pictures in. And again, if you want that list, send me an email. Anybody?